Welcome everybody to this week's uh, Green Bank Observatory Community Zoom. I'm Jim Jackson. Just a few words about uh, what's happening at the observatory before handing it over to Dave, who will introduce today's speaker. So um, many of you probably heard the, the news uh, that the observatory is now um, paused in its operation. There was damage to one of the 16 wheels that the observatory, or that the telescope moves on, um, the, one of these azimuth wheels. The wheel is about 54 inches in diameter. Um, there's a chunk of metal that came out of one. It's about the size of a fist, maybe a little bit bigger. It's beautiful. It's in the shape of Australia. Uh, but because of that damage, um, we, we will not be operating the telescope until we fix it. We do have a spare wheel. We know the procedure. We're working with a company to, um, to help us uh, with the replacement process. That should happen by the end of next week or the next week. So one of the issues is that we need a jack to jack the antenna up and finding a jack to lift 17 million pounds is, is a non-trivial exercise. But um, we're, we're confident that we can fix it. Um, what we want to do before resuming normal operations, however, is to make sure that the other wheels are okay. We're going to inspect them and we're developing procedures to do that. But um, I'll keep you, I will certainly keep you posted. Um, we, if, if all goes well, we should be back on the air in a couple of weeks. So um, stay tuned for details. Uh, in, in other news, there's a special call for uh, low frequency filler time. That deadline is rapidly approaching. I believe it's Friday. And um, our normal call for proposals went out last week and that will have the, the usual February 1st deadline. So hope, uh, um, to see lots of proposals. We had a nice um, AAS meeting in Seattle. Uh, thank you for all of those who attended the special session and uh, some of the other Green Bank um, talks and posters. Um, it was, I was very proud of the observatory and it's showing and facilitating the great science that we do here. All right, so with that, I will hand off to Dave Freyer who will introduce today's speaker. Welcome everybody um, to our community Zoom today. We're happy to have Dr. Emily Parent um, here to talk about searching for pulsars and fast transients with the GBT and the status of the Green Bank North Celestial Cap um, Survey and future prospects. She's a postdoc at the Institute of Space Science, Sciences in Barcelona. So go ahead and take it away, Emily. I would like to remind the speakers um, that put your questions in the chat in the bottom of your Zoom window, and then we'll address them at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right, I'll share my screen. Hopefully everything will work. We can, yep, we can see it. All right. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for inviting me to give um, a talk here. I want to start by saying that all the results I'll be presenting today um, are really a collaborative efforts. Um, actually, most of those results um, were produced by uh, some graduate students uh, in I, our collaboration, the more more recent stuff. Um, so I'm really presenting on behalf of the whole team. All right, so let's get started. GBNCC uh, is an all sky survey uh, for pulsars. We operate at 350 megahertz um, with 100, 100 megahertz hertz bandwidth. Uh, we do the full uh, sky that GBT can see, which is um, everything above a declination of minus 40 degrees. We started collecting data in 2009. Um, processing kind of started a little bit later, um, quite heavy searching that we're doing, uh, but um, we eventually uh, processed and um, finished collecting our data uh, in uh, earlier or well, last year. I guess in 2022. To cover the, the entire sky, uh, we needed to divide the sky into 125,000 sky pointings. Uh, to try to save a bit on survey speed, uh, we took two minutes, two minute scans per pointing. In total, that generated uh, a little more than 780 terabytes of data, it's a pretty large data set. Um, and in total, um, that required um, nearly 6,000 hours with GBT for those 13 years. 
with the data we searched uh, for periodic signal from pulsars uh, using both fast Fourier transform, the standard technique with accelerated search um, to look for pulsar in, in uh, binaries. And uh, also in the last few years, we were also using a fast folding algorithm, uh, which really is um, designed to improve sensitivity to so pulsars, pulsars with speed period of more than half a second. We are also doing single pulse searching to look for um, pulsars that emit um, sporadically. Uh, so really single pulses, we call them rats, uh, and also FRB. So we do uh, search at dispersion measure, uh, which really is, is it's a effect that comes from um, dispersion, the interstellar medium, and there's a certain amount of dispersion that you would expect from source that are in the galaxy. We go way uh, beyond the galaxy uh, to look for potential uh, fast rate bursts. Really, the primary goal of the, of the survey was to look for millisecond pulsars. So those are the most rapidly rotating pulsar with spin periods of only a few milliseconds. Um, that would be suitable for pulsar timing rays and trying to detect um, gravitational wave in the nanohertz uh, um, frequency range. Here on the plot, I'll just mention here the, the top, on the top right, um, what we're seeing really is the, the limiting flux sensitivity uh, in the survey area. So it's a, it's a bit confusing here. There's kind of a white spot. So that was from, that plot was generated two years ago um, in, uh, it was shown in McEwen et al. 2020, uh, one of our active grad students. And um, so the white band um, that really follows kind of the more the galactic plane um, that was not observed at that point, but now we have. There's only that part here, that circular part that we do not see. And the basically the, the fact that here um, the it's more intense, the flux, the limiting flux is higher. That's really just because of the sky temperature and because we're observing. Um, lower frequency and the plane is quite bright. Okay, so just quick survey status. We did finish um, collecting all our data and uh, we've also process, processed the whole data set and we've had a look at um, the results. In total, we've found 195 uh, pulsars, uh, 35 of which are millisecond pulsars. We also have the R rats, so the sporadic emitters, and one FRB. And I'll discuss, discuss a bit more of the individual sources uh, as we're going uh, through the slides. Also, um, something that is somewhat recent um, that we've been doing um, for the past two, two and a half years um, is to um, follow up our new discoveries for timing purposes uh, with Chime, uh, the Chime Pulsar backend. So we um, have a collaboration going uh, with Chime uh, such that all the, the sources that are accessible to the Chime sky, um, which is all those with declination above 15, uh, minus 15 degrees, uh, we go and monitor uh, with Chime. And that just makes follow up much easier because you can pretty much um, monitor all your source every day. Um, since Chime is a stationary telescope, it's a transient telescope, uh, we can pretty much uh, yeah, monitor all of our source uh, and yeah, every day and doesn't require um, any extra observing time, which um, with GBT, it's been a bit more difficult to get uh, time specifically for um, timing our new discoveries and also the observations usually tend to be sparse, which um, makes science difficult, especially when you have um, systems in uh, somewhat compact binaries and it becomes a real challenge. So currently we are monitoring more than 130 pulsars with Chime and it's been really great. I'm going to talk a bit more about this um, towards the end of the talk. And uh, in the end, 
we did achieve our goal to be a prolific supplier of um, high precision NSPs for pulsar timing arrays. And uh, in fact, in the past 10 years, so since we, we've started uh, the survey, uh, we've produced a lot more. Uh, we can see here, we've produced a lot more, well, we've found a lot more um, MSPs that were in fact suitable for pulsar timing arrays um, than any other surveys or technique during that same time, time span. We also have a few more um, more recent pulsars that we're still um, monitoring and testing if um, it, they will be precise enough to be included in pulsar timing arrays. So some of the somewhat recent and um, results that are certainly worth um, mentioning, uh, we found several double neutron star system. Those are really prized system uh, because they tend to be excellent test bed for um, gravity in strong regime. So um, general relativity. Uh, sorry, I just got distracted by my cat who's visiting me. Um, right, so double neutron star system, also potential good targets for mass measurements. Uh, our most recent one, um, PSR J1759, um, it's um, actually rather uncommon um, pulsar, which we do believe is in a double neutron star system, because um, its its spin period suggests that basically it did not undergo recycling uh, or very little of it. Uh, recycling is basically for those who aren't that familiar with pulsars and millisecond pulsar. Recycling is when you have a old pulsar uh, in a binary with another pulsar um, that as it evolves, eventually um, you get mass transfer from the companion star onto the neutron star that spins it up and bring, bring oh, the pulsar um, down to this corner of the, what we call PP dot diagram. So really the spin period of pulsar versus the rate of change of that spin period uh, with time. Um, so those MSPs are usually located right around here, um, and they have much shorter spin period than this one uh, in particular. Uh, so we do know binary pulsars uh, with seemingly heavy companions that um, are in binary system, but this one is pretty tight. Um, and it also kind of is kind of between the normal radio pulsar population and, and the millisecond pulsar, which suggests that there might have been a little bit of accretion, but not a lot. Um, it's also eccentric. So anyway, you, you can have a look at um, that paper that was also um, led by one of our students. And um, yes, very interesting system. Um, it was because of the eccentricity, the tight orbit, the heavy companion, we were able to um, obtain a um, or really to measure a relativistic uh, effect, so a post Keplerian uh, parameter. So that way we can constrain the total mass of the system. Uh, as you get more post Keplerian, um, as you get more sensitive to more uh, post Keplerian parameter, that's when you can reach really measurements of the mass of the two um, components of the binary. But for this one, it might take a little while before that happens because, yeah, the, the timing is not that precise given that um, it's not one of the MSPs, which are really they tend to be really the best clock and highest precision we can reach uh, when we're doing timing analysis. Another interesting um, pulsar, another millisecond pulsar uh, that um, we had actually discovered a few years ago in 2014, but uh, we really learned more and more as we kept timing the source and uh, improved our timing um, precision. And we were able to measure, again, this system. It's not a double neutron star system. The companion is rather light, um, but um, because of highly precise timing and also the effect of the inclination of the binary, we were able to measure its mass with very high precision. And it's also, it also turned out to be the heavy, heaviest 
um, neutron star that we um, that is known to us with a mass of 2.08 solar mass. So that is interesting, and also with improved timing um, and uh, a collaboration with the NICER team using the precise radio ephemeris, uh, they were able to uh, constrain really the mass and the radius of the star from um, its uh, X-ray emission, because this source is also bright in the X-rays. It's not very a distant source. And um, from that, they were able to obtain um, a measurement of the radius of that neutron star. So that is certainly an interesting source. It's also one of the, it's now, well, I, I think a couple, two or three years ago, it has been added um, to the pulsar timing arrays. Uh, another result, which I mentioned briefly earlier in the talk, um, is that we have found one FRB. Uh, it's the only one that we've found in all our observing time. Uh, it's, I guess this one is interesting, although it's somewhat marginal, it's not super bright. Um, it's interesting uh, because it's really the first source of FRB that was discovered in a blind search below 400 megahertz. Since then, there's been pulsar detect, uh, not pulsar, sorry, FRBs that have been detected at below 400 megahertz um, with low far and also GBT um, has also made detections. Um, the 350 megahertz receiver of um, other FRBs, but those are known repeating sources. So they, they were targeted observation towards position of known FRBs. Uh, another thing that was somewhat interesting from that FRB is that uh, we did not detect scattering, uh, which we, which could be expected that when observing at lower frequencies and also very distant source, um, narrow pulse, but there were no scattering. So that means that at least the environment of at least some FRB progenitors are not in a environment prone to scattering. So that tells us a bit about their environment and um, yes, about their environment. And that helps a bit towards uh, understanding uh, really what they are. In terms of rate, it wasn't that helpful. Um, the really because it was so so faint, we only detected one. It, yeah, it didn't help that much. It was consistent with other rates that have been derived at different frequencies, but the uncertainties are just huge so the, yeah overall not very constraining consistent but not very constraining some of the actually very recent results um uh, we uh, this paper by joe swigum who um is a postdoc uh, has been in the collaboration for a long time uh actually the, yeah his paper was accepted yesterday uh, so should be coming out um quite soon. Uh, and in that paper, we present um, 12 new GBNCC pulsars. Most of them are, uh, or actually six of them are millisecond pulsars. And also the, the, the timing uh, properties of those sources. So six new MSPs. So MSPs are, tend to be always interesting. Uh, one of them is a relativistic double neutron star system. In a nine day orbit, it's eccentric. And for that system, we do measure also one post Keplerian uh, parameter, uh, which is really total mass of the system. Uh, and it does suggest also from studies, um, multi wavelength studies. Um, and for some reason that we go uh, through in the paper, we do believe that the companion would be a double, uh, would be another neutron star, even though we don't detect pulsations from it. Um, we also have two new MSPs that are suitable for pulsar timing arrays. So the, 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 our timing over a few years has proven that those MSPs are really precise and useful for PTAs. Uh, we also found two that uh, exhibit strong gamma ray pulsations, uh, which we can see on the plot on the right here. Um, so the gamma ray pulse profile is in black. And uh, we have 
in blue and red um, the pulse profiles at um, 800 and 20 megahertz and 350 megahertz. So the red is 350 megahertz. Um, so those are always interesting for trying to understand emission mechanism. Um, we know that both radio and the gamma ray emission is coherent emission produced uh, in the magnetosphere. Uh, it's non-thermal, but it's still not clear on how that process happened. And we always need just a bigger sample of uh, pulsars that emits both in gamma rays and um, radio to try to nail down really the emission process in pulsars. We also have two black widows um, that show eclipse. So black widows are, I guess, a type, a subclass of MSPs um, in where you, you have a compact binary, usually um, with the orbital period less than a day, and a very light companion. And the companion we are thought to be um, either non-degenerate or a partially degenerate stellar core that are too close to the pulsar and they get um, ablated. So they lose mass because uh, of the pulsar wind. Um, they, be, because of the tight orbit and there's a lot of material around those system, uh, we tend to see radio eclipses uh, during superior conjunction when the pulsar kind of goes behind um, the companion. We really, the, the that material is too dense and we lose, um, we, we stop detecting the pulsar and then can the, the, we can start detecting it again um, as um, during egress. So we found two, uh, two black widows. Uh, one here, it's in the bottom here. Um, here you can see it's actually the timing residuals. In red, we have um, uh, the pulse times of arrival uh, at 350 megahertz and in blue at 820 megahertz. Dispersion, um, lower frequencies are more sensitive to dispersion. So you eclipses are a lot more common in those systems at lower frequencies. And here you can see that um, the signal is totally eclipsed at superior conjunction. So that's an orbital phase of um, 0.25. So that's when it passes behind its companion. And for the other one, it is eclipsed um, at 350 megahertz, but not at 820. Um, and those again, are, those kind of things are helpful, one to constrain um, the uh, geometry of the binary, and also just to understand in general how um, just binary evolution uh, in MSPs and their progenitor, and also gives clue as to how come sometimes we find um, MSPs that do not have a companion um, or they are observed to be isolated, while we know that um, in the point of view of evolution, they had to have a companion to accrete from. Um, and in this paper, we actually do have one um, isolated MSP. So yeah, I invite you to take a look at this very fresh result, um, which is already on the archive. Um, it was put in the archive a little while ago, but uh, it was accepted uh, yesterday. Um, in terms of uh, ongoing work, I mentioned at the beginning uh, that we are collaborating with the Chime Pulsar team um, to monitor up our pulsars. And really, we have a timing pipeline in place that has just been doing miracles. <laughs> uh, we, we will be publishing some results um, soon in, in a few months. Um, that work is currently being led by um, uh, Alex McEwen, just one of our grad students. Um, and basically what is kind of special about um, this work, well, the very high cadence of observation, of course, which helps to solve um, pulsars that are in binary system, but um, also to really improve the timing precision of any pulsar, because we do a monthly update of um, the evolving timing model uh, from the time data. So Chime would collect data for a month, um, pass that data uh, to, to us, we update the timing model, and then we send it back to Chime. And then every time we do this iteration, um, the data quality um, just improves uh, at Chime. So really the 
the precision in timing, uh, we've seen it's improving dramatically. Uh, orders of mag order, so singular order of magnitude in some cases. Uh, we've also, because of that, we've also been able to measure proper motion, um, measure relativistic effects in some of the systems. Um, there's even one um, pulsar that was thought to be isolated for, I mean, for since its discovery maybe 15 years ago. And um, with the chime data, actually, we were able to uncover a um, very long orbital modulation, uh, longer than a year um, from that time, that chime data. Um, but yeah, there'll be more de details um, in a paper by our student uh, not in hopefully not too long. Um, we also have um, two other grad students right now that are leading uh, some projects. One is um, on properties of some of our transient pulsars and our rats, and also how to go about timing those sources. Um, and we also have other new pulsars um, and not new pulsars, but with very improved timing, uh, including pulse, uh, pulsar timing arrays, pulsars um, that will be um, also published uh, rather soon. In terms of the future for GBNCC, we do have some plans, even if we finish collecting data, we're not done with that data. Uh, so one of the things we are, we want to do uh, is to reprocess that data using a, um, a different type of acceleration search to um, basically be more sensitive to binary system. Um, so in very compact orbit, and we will be um, most likely be doing this um, in the next few weeks. And that work is being led by um, a postdoc at um, uh, UWM, so Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, that system was actually applied. Um, well, it's, I think the, the paper hasn't been out yet, but it has found by reprocessing um, data from PARC's uh, multi-beam survey and HTRU survey, pulsar survey, um, they found something like 90 pulsars that were initially missed. And those must be very interesting pulsars. So um, we're looking forward to that. Um, we also have um, a new candidate rating, um, which is based on machine learning algorithm with neural networks. Uh, it, uh, this was, well, this has been led by uh, one of our students also. That algorithm is called Pac-Man. I think there's a, a draft about to be circulated. So maybe in a few months, it'll come out. So we plan on um, really reapplying that rating on all of our um, candidates and um, see if there were some pulsars that we might have missed in our data set. And yeah, I guess one thing that is, or no, I'll skip that, but you can ask me if you have some questions. Um, and very last thing, uh, we are working towards um, up, up, uploading our um, four, four or five millions of, of candidates to um, the Pulsar Search Collaborator Collaboratory um, Candidate Viewer, a new viewer um, in collaboration with um, Nanograph, but we want to really have a lot of new, new pairs of eyes looking at our data um, to see if we might have missed uh, good uh, potential pulsars because we've generated so many candidates. We even looked at uh, a large fraction of all that has been generated. So we're looking forward to that and uh, really have some students looking at our, our data. So yeah, that's that's it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so people can go ahead and put in questions in the Q and A. I think I mentioned in the chat, but if you could put them in the Q and A, uh, Emily, go ahead and take some questions. And we got our first question that just came in. Um, why do we see a positive residual peak during the eclipse in one of the Black Widow pulsars, middle one in the plots? Is it right. because of increase in DM during the eclipse that's not modeled? Exactly. So 
th yeah, that, that's exactly it. So as really dispersion, when you have a plasma, the electron in that plasma will cause a delay in um, the, the, the photons, the radio photons. Oops, I'm sorry, my... <laughs> Oh, we can still just, hear you. <laughs> right, my I I I suspect my internet will go down because uh, yeah my I just lost electricity here. <laughs> oh no! Just just one minute. <laughs> If anybody else has any questions, we can put them in the window, and hopefully we'll be able to come back. What we can also do is if you do put the questions in the Q&A, please, um, we can record those. So if Emily goes offline, we can still provide her with the questions and we capture email addresses on those questions so we can get responses back to you. Thank you, Paul. We did just lose Emily. Oh, okay. Oh no. Okay. That's a... Oh, she's coming back. Welcome back. Wow. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Yeah, that tends to happen around lunchtime when everyone, I don't know, come back from work and uh, uh, yeah, very sorry. Okay, but you can hear me now. Yes, yes we can hear you. So we had, okay. had a couple other, a few questions that came in while um, you were out. Uh, um, in the most recent call for GBO time, there was a comment about possible considered drift scan time being available. Are you or others interested in more drift scan time for pulsar searching with the GBT? Right. Uh, so we did have a, um... There was a, a drift scan um, survey at 350 megahertz. Um, I think one of the, I guess, I don't know for even different frequencies, um, but I think one of the challenge was coming that uh, we were covering a lot of the same sky that uh, was surveyed uh, by Arecibo at the same frequency. So, you know, in terms of, of discovery, may, maybe with Arecibo it was more the, the way to go, but now that Arecibo is, is, is down, I, I'm actually not quite certain about the drift scan. Um, I know there, there, there was a um, drift scan survey at our same frequency, but um, yeah, no, I, I can't say right now what we're kind of, well, most people that are working on GBNCC, one thing that we are, doing now is more um, a pilot survey at L-band as uh, targeting a specific part of the sky uh, really to test if um, to see really the just get a, an idea if it's worth going uh, larger scale uh, at L-band with GBT uh, excluding specifically the sky that um, can be seen by fast so right now that's where our efforts are more geared to okay um, there was a question asking about what is the dispersion distance to the FRB detected? Yes. Um, yes, it's actually uh, right. I, I calculated that. Uh, it was around 600 mega, 600 megaparsec, I think. So it was seven times higher than maximum um, DM that we could expect from the galaxy in that direction. So it wasn't, you know, really uh, cosmological FRBs that we've seen, but it's it's certainly not galactic. And another question: What are the theories about the causes of the gamma ray pulsations, and why PSR of J twelve twenty one minus oh six thirty three only shows them every other radio pulse? Right. So that's a good question. <laughs> Um, well, both part of that questions are good questions. So we know that the gamma ray emission, we know it's not coherent. 
and they are usually detected from millisecond pulsars that have strong um, or they have high what we call spin down power so they lose a lot of energy due to dipole radiation um, and yeah we call that spin down power and spin down power goes as the spin down rate over the period cube so for msps you have a small spin down rate so they're really stable they their period doesn't change much because you've accreted on them so they're really stable and they have very short spin periods so that gives them a very large spin down luminosity or spin down power so a lot of that dipole radiation is taken um taken away and those pulsars so the msps with large spin down luminosity they are the one that we tend to see gamma ray emission those and also young pulsars uh, with very strong magnetic fields so we know that has to do with really if you have an msp you you yeah either either young pulsars or um, the one that have very large spin down luminosity in terms of the say like the alignment like so we do see all kind of profile pulse profiles in radio pulsars um here like a double peak like this is not that uncommon um probably just that there are two region uh, in the magnetosphere along the open field line where you there's uh, emission being produced um, or you are seeing two of them and um, yeah and the gamma ray really in the in this case the yeah they there's some alignment here but it really varies from one source to the other and we are we are not quite understanding uh, fully how to interpret that um, but it's getting there with the stronger, like a larger population of those uh, pulsar that emit in both bands. Um, but yeah, I can't provide a clear explanation to that yet. Okay, we had a question related to chime. Is the detection sensitivity, sensitivity of chime sufficient to observe and duplicate observations of the more weaker GBD detectable MSPs? Right, so it really depends on um, the spectrum of um, the pulsar. So there are some, some pulsars um, for which actually with chime, um, it um, really the, um, the precision of the pulse of arrival, like say during transit. So with chime, we can um, track pretty much any given source for I think 10 minutes um, while it transits above the telescope. Um, in some cases during those transit, we, we actually are able to extract much more precise um, pulse times of arrival than with um, uh, than what we could do at say 350 megahertz. It really depends from source to source. Uh, it's spectrum, and we usually don't have a very good handle on its on the spectrum uh, beforehand. It, it also helps with chime that it has a pretty wide um, observing band, so you do reach 400 megahertz and um, up to uh, 800 from 400 megahertz to 800 megahertz. So you, the large bandwidth also helps. It really depends source to source. There, for most of them, we were able to get a detection. Um, there's uh, maybe two, two dozen of the pulsar that we tried to follow up that uh, we just couldn't detect. Okay. Um, well, I had a question just in terms of the 35 um, millisecond pulsars that you found or detected in the survey, was that about the, what you were expecting to see at whatever sensitivity level that you cut out? Or do you expect, and do you expect to find a lot more if you can dig a little deeper with those, uh, the reprocessing that you mentioned? I think the, the, from earlier on, I think the predictions were about 40. Oh, so okay. we're, we're in the right spot. Yeah. Um, but I do believe that there were some um, known MSPs in the sky area that we target that we were targeting uh, that we did not detect mm -hmm. and then the question is well maybe those are um, you know they could be eclipsing or some transient type of emission or maybe actually when we surveyed that part of the sky maybe the data quality wasn't good um, was or well was diminished because um, sometimes yeah Radio frequency interference sometimes can take away 30%, uh, 40% of our observing band, and then 
Uh, we don't necessarily model that uh, when we do a population study. Um, we take more the average um, loss due to RFI. Uh, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, we had another question that came in. Has FAST reported any data on any of the new MSPs you detected? So do you know FAST following but, up? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It could very well be. I know that a year or two ago, they did have a, um, a paper with uh, 200 new pulsars, but there was a long list of redetected source. Um, so it is possible that they have some of our sources um, in the, that they have uh, reported some measurements on some of our MSPs. Uh, but it is also true that we are not, they are, the MSPs that we find are usually not as close to the galactic disk um, than what the region that chime, uh, that FAST is targeting. So FAST right now, the, the survey is really the, the, we're doing a galactic plane at very low galactic latitude survey. We do have some pulsars in that area, but for MSPs, it's quite a difficult region to target at 350 megahertz. Um, okay, um, I think, unless somebody else has another question coming in at the last minute, I think we are finished with our presentation today. So I'd like to thank Emily Perrin um, for presenting the results, uh, the, the GBD results here. We really appreciate that, an excellent talk. Um, community Zoom will be in two weeks. On the schedule is um, Michael Garrett from Jordan Bank who will be giving a SETI presentation um, with the GBT and Breakthrough Listen. So that's in a, in a couple of weeks. So thank you again, Emily, and, and thank you all for attending. Bye. I see you. Bye-bye.